Hey, everybody. Welcome into the Phillies Talk podcast presented by Team Toyota. And we're sitting down to record this after a pretty exciting Phillies win. A seven-run outburst in the eighth inning Monday night, Tuesday night rather, against the Marlins in the series opener. And the Phillies pulled that one out, 8-3. Avoid some more bad vibes against a Miami team that's been big trouble for them in recent years. And Jim, uh, we just saw a lot of two-strike hitting. Nick Maton with, uh, you know, the big maybe the biggest blow, the biggest clutch blow in that eighth inning. But kind of just... Walk us through the emotions of uh, Tuesday night. Yeah, I mean, the emotions, there was some energy in that ballpark. I think it was only 10,000 and change in the ballpark, but they were loud and they really uh, got into it and they were feeding off the rally. And in turn, I think the players were feeding off the fans' emotion. Uh, they did nothing all night against a rookie right-hander named Cody Potit. He used to pitch at UCLA. I remember him. Um, but they did nothing against him and they came alive late. Um, and uh, they had 14 hits on the night. Half of them were in that eighth inning. Um, so, you know, they, they give up the lead in the top. or they, It was a tie ball game in the top of the eighth. Alvarado, um, he's an adventure, man. He uh, strike out wild pitch um, that I'm not sure Nat maybe shouldn't have handled. Uh, but it was 100 miles an hour. Um, and then um, – two run home runs. So they're down three, one going into the bottom of the eighth and they rally against the bullpen. Great rally. Um, with one out, um, they send what nine straight reach base, seven hits, two walks. I mean, they just, it was just classic. Keep the line moving. It was classic. Don't do too much or don't try to do too much. It was classic. You don't have to swing from the heels. Uh, it was classic. You know, when is it a single up the middle? Good enough. And, and that's what, that's what got it for him. You're right. There was a lot of good two strike at bats, two strike hitting. Andrew Knapp at one point was down 0-2 and he came back to work uh, full count and eventually a walk turned out to be a huge walk, which preceded, I think, Maton's game tying hit. Two young players, Maton and Alec Bohm had big hits. I know Alec Bohm, you know, you look at his numbers and he's struggling, but gosh, he gets some big hits. Um, especially to the right side with that inside out swing of his, um, he, he can hit for some gap power to the other way with that inside out swing. So he had that big double, which scored Hoskins and then Maton ties it. Knapp has the walk. Ronald Torres, great story. <laughs> he comes off the bench. Hadn't had an RBI since 2019. He had one RBI in 2019, he played seven games in the majors. And that RBI came when he was hit by a pitch with the bases loaded. So, um, it's better to uh, get the RBI with you know the actual bat instead of taking one off the leg or something. So it was a tremendous win. Uh, it was an emotional win. I mean, Zach Wheeler was great, absolutely great again. His last four starts have been absolutely dazzling. He is pinpoint precision, surgical with his fastball command right now. Um, but, you know, alas, he made a throwing error. It cost him an unearned run, and they don't score. He gets – he gets a no decision, but he was a huge part of that win. Um, and, you know, big picture, uh, they're 22 and 20. You don't win that game. You're 21 and 21. So it's a big difference between being two over at the quarter mark of the season and uh, and being 500. And, uh, like you mentioned, the Marlins have given them big trouble. Last year, the Phillies went three and seven against the Marlins. Uh, lost five of seven late down in Miami to fall out of the playoff scene. Uh, and, you know, you lose that game last night on a, uh, on a two-run home run to the leadoff man off, off your big bullpen guy, Alvarado. I mean, you lose that game. It's like, oh, here we go again, the Marlins, those, those, um, those uh, add your own expletive Marlins. And, uh, but, you know, the Phillies turned it around and, and won the game. So there was none of those feelings. So I thought it was important to, on a lot of levels, to get that win, stay two over five, go two over 500, stay over 500. And um, maybe just let the Marlins and yourself and your own clubhouse know that it's a new year and you're not going to kick our asses anymore. It was also important in the sense that, you know, this, this team is built around uh, winning games with Aaron Nola, Zach Wheeler, and Zach Eflin. And those three guys have pitched very well this season. But you know what the Phillies' record is in their 26 starts this season? It's 14 and 12, which is – you know, Yeah, you've got to win those guys on the mound. Yeah, that's not nearly good enough to be two games over 500 with those guys on the mound. They are 500 with their fourth and fifth starters on the mound, which is, you know, beneficial. That is a plus. But this was a problem last year for the Phillies, that they didn't win enough games in the Nola and Wheeler starts. I think they were either one game under 500 or at 500 when those two pitched. 
And we've seen it a lot with Wheeler in particular, where like he just cruises through an order, five shutout innings, six shutout innings, something like that, but doesn't have the run support to back him. Uh, you know, that, that changed last night. And something else I wanted to bring up is that over the Phillies' last nine games, they've scored 28 runs after the seventh inning. So three runs per game after the seventh inning of the Phillies' last nine games. Like, at what point do we start looking at that and and thinking, okay, maybe this team, like, has the ability to show up late in games. I mean, maybe some of it's fluky. They did lose a couple of those games, and those were uh, late inning runs that didn't really matter drastically in the scheme of things. But that's pretty impressive to score that many runs late in games off of teams' bullpens. Yeah, maybe it tells you a little bit how tough starting pitching is. I mean, I know there's a lot of velocity down in bullpens these days. Everybody's 98. Um, but, you know, generally your best pitchers are in the rotation. There's a lot of great – they've played a lot of division games, a lot of great starting pitching in this division. But we've been searching for an identity for this team. Maybe that's it. They, they fight. Um, I mean, they literally fought in the dugout on Sunday, and that overshadowed everything. Um, it overshadowed not having enough players – which to me was um, inexcusable. Uh, it, um, but, and it also overshadowed the way they, they battled back into that game after being eight runs down. So they showed real fight Sunday. They showed real fight late in the game on uh, Tuesday night to win the homestand opener. I mean, but you're right. The last two games, Wheeler has pitched absolute gems at home, and they don't put a, even a run up until the seventh inning. you got to give these guys some run support. Uh, even though they're good pitchers, they need run support. They become better pitchers with run support because they have a little leeway, you know, um, and um, it allows you to really attack with your fastball, I think, when you have a lead. So they need to, uh, they need to be more consistent offensively. The strikeouts are still way too high. Uh, they need to make more contact. Seventh inning, uh, eighth inning last night, uh, case in point, what contact can do for a team, right? I mean, Ronald Torres, 5-for-8, 155 pounds. He's just looking to put the head of the bat on the ball, and good things happen. So make more contact, strike out less. Cut down the swings. Use the whole field. Um, you know, there's big velocities out there. Yeah, but use it to your advantage. Short to the ball. Use all that velocity to create, to create um, you know, pop off the bat, jump off the bat, exit velocity, whatever you want to call it. Use that velocity to hit the ball hard in the gaps. Um, but – you know, hey, really good win. Um, really good win Tuesday night. Jim, how about Nick Naton? I mean, we've talked about him before on the podcast, so he kind of, um, you know, earned his way to this spot. He was never, like, you know, regarded as a top 100 league-wide prospect or anything like that, but he's played well defensively. He's played well offensively, sitting over 300, and he's played almost every day. He started 22 games out of the 27 the Phillies have played since the day that he was called up. I don't think anybody had that in their cars before this season began, but they sure have needed him with all the, the, just the injuries that Phillies have been ravaged by. Yeah. When you get those injuries, even when you don't, you need, you always need that X factor, that under the radar guy uh, to step up. All good teams get that under the radar guy to step up and he's been it. He's filled a big role. Uh, They've had injuries, both middle, middle infield spots. And he's going out there and done an excellent, excellent job defensively. He's gotten some big hits. He's hitting over 300. Um, he is, uh, he hits a fastball. He's ready to hit the fastball. He is very, you know, quick from here to there, here to there on the fastball. He's, he's short to the ball and, and that's good. Um, so he's done a great job, big hit last night. To me, the, the most, the reason I think he's been successful, he's, he's, he's fundamentally sound, uh, but he's not scared. He's not intimidated. He's not awed by the scene. I mean, he respects the game. He respects, uh, people around him, but he's not scared. Um, he's not overwhelmed. He's not in his own head. He's not thinking too much. He's, he's, he's reacting. You know, it's a, you, you, it's, you have to be, you know, you have to have a head on your shoulders in, in, in baseball. You have to be a smart guy and um, think things through. You have to have a smart approach, but once, you know, once they, once you get between the lines, I really think your thinking has to have been done beforehand in your preparation. So when you get into the game, it can just be react. It's not thinking, it's reacting. It's part of you. And, and that's what I see in him, really good instincts, not afraid, um, plays tough, um, gamer, uh, all baseball player, all baseball player. So uh, been a really good contribution. Um, and, you know, a, a feather in the cap for the scouting department. He wasn't like, what was he, like an eighth and ninth round pick? 
Um, I don't even know. Can you look that up? Yeah, I'm looking so, it up. Keep going. Feather in, the, feather in the cap to the scouting department and to the player development department, um, which takes a lot of heat. Both entities do, but they got themselves a baseball player and a contributor on a major league team, and that's a good thing. Nick Maton was a seventh round pick, and he's been the most productive seventh round pick in that year's draft. It was the 2017 yeah. draft. He's one of only, let's see, one, two, three. He's one of only four guys from that round to make the majors, the only position player, and the only one with positive wins above replacement so far. Uh, he was called up, Nick Maton, a month ago today as we sit down to record this on May 19th. He came up on April 19th, and it's only been one month, but in that one month, he's pretty much been what Phillies fans expected from Scott Kingery. Uh, and Scott Kingery is one of these many Phillies who are shelved right now with injuries. Kingery, Didi, uh, JT Real Muto dealing with an injury, although he's not on the IL. Uh, Jojo Romero. Let's kind of go through each one of those guys first. Uh, let's start with Didi. Didi finally went on the uh, where he belonged on the injured list. Uh, has not played since last Wednesday night. Second time he's experienced in swelling in his throwing elbow, right elbow. It is not the Tommy John ligament that he had repaired a few years ago. That's on the inside part of the elbow. This is actually on the outside part of the elbow. It's an impact injury. He fell on it, ranging out in the center field to make a catch on a uh, shallow fly ball. And uh, it's a bit, you know, ju just judging by what he says, it's, it's kind of they're They're not sure what it is. It sounds like, like maybe a bone bruise or contusion that the swelling has just been slow to dissipate. So, they're working on getting that swelling out of there, but I don't know. When Didi's saying we're not really sure what's happening, that's a little troubling. Um, but they need to get that behind him and get him on the field because he uh, he's just starting to surf stop. So is Didi trying to kind of say that this is totally unrelated to the the Tommy John surgery? Like like even if he never had previous elbow issues, that this fall uh, would have caused that injury anyway. Indeed, totally unrelated to the Tommy John surgery. He says the UCL, um, which is the Tommy John ligament, is completely intact. You know, that graft or uh, reconstruction is fine. Yeah, Tommy John is, you know, on the inside part of your elbow, if you push on that soft part. And this is on the hard outer part of the elbow bony part. He said he's, quote, unquote, got a huge lump there. But unrelated to Tommy John, that's fine, he says. So, because, you know, I think when a lot of people saw elbow, uh, and the fact that it was like persistent this season, there was concern because this is only the second month of a two-year $28 million contract for Didi. And given the past elbow issues, this, this is not a great development for the Phillies early in the first year of his deal that he's had so much trouble staying on the field. No, no, it's not a good development that Bryce Harper has more than a decade left. and He's had lower back, and shoulder um, problems. So injuries are never a good thing. Didi's your start, starting shortstop. You need him on the field. Um, but you know, it, yeah, it, it makes you wonder. We, we, I don't think he's played uh, particularly well defensively this year. Range isn't what it used to be. Um, maybe the DH can't come fast enough for, for these Phillies. Um, cause he still has a, he has a good bat, left-handed stick, gets some big hits. And, uh, maybe that's a potential landing spot for him on the, on the back end of that two-year deal. Well, so D had the Tommy John surgery after 2018. Uh, Jojo Romero, the left-handed Phillies reliever, is going to have his Tommy John surgery here in the coming days. Really stinks for a young guy who showed some promise when he came up late last season and at times early this season. Although, you know, I remember you asking Joe Girardi several times in April, hey, what's up with Jojo's velocity? Well, I guess now we have our answer, huh? Yeah, Jojo was a starting pitcher uh, in the minor league system. A guy kind of known for his pitchability. Um, but made it to the big leagues, converted to reliever, had a nice jump in velocity, and that's kind of how he, you know, got to the major leagues. Uh, going to the bullpen, built some more velocity. All of a sudden, he's 97, but, you know, sometimes that velocity, uh, that jump in velocity can put a lot of strain on, on your elbow and other parts, and you break down. You see it's just a, a, a rash of it around baseball. I mean, I've, I've, I was just thinking about all the elbow surgeries in the Phillies organization the last couple of years. I mean, guys that have moved on, you know, Adam Morgan, he had flexor pronator. That's in the elbow area. Tommy Hunter, flexor pronator. That's in the elbow area. David Robertson, Tommy John, I think, and flexor pronator. I mean, he had a lot of mileage. He was older. Um, 
Hunter had a lot of mileage. Um, he was always back. He got his first big league hit last night. Tommy Hunter did with the Mets. But uh, and then you know Sir Anthony Dominguez, big hard thrower. Tommy John surgery. Victor Arano had that really good year um, for the Phillies when Gabe Kapler was manager a couple of years ago. He ended up in elbow surgery. So uh, and there's other guys in the minor league system uh, that we haven't even gotten to that have had them. So there's a lot of velocity in this game, uh, and 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 I think players who go out there and try to develop that velocity um, uh, as their calling card, you know, sometimes pay the price price for it in surgery. I don't want to put everything on these modern um, teaching methods because the guy's been having Tommy John surgery, you know, for a generation plus there's been elbow injuries for a long time in this game, but uh, they, they're very prevalent. They're, they're, they're more prevalent, I think than ever. And, uh, it's, it's sad to see a 23 year old guy, Jojo, going to be shut down now for, you know, Tommy John's like a year, 14, 15, 16, 17 months before you're really ready to go again. And that even might be best case scenario. So he'll get it taken care of and hopefully he'll come back and have, ha, have a good career. Um, but you know, it's, 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 it's never easy to lose a young pitching talent to, to Tommy John surgery. It sure seems like in these days, if you throw hard, you're going to have Tommy John surgery yeah. something early in your career. Yeah. It seems like it's almost a rite of passage. I was watching Dodgers Diamondbacks the other day because Walker Bueller was pitching and he's one of those guys I just love watching pitch. And so I was going through his game logs over the last two years. And I think there was only like one game that he hit a hundred pitches between this, between the start of 2020 and, and now. And I'm thinking like, wow, that's really surprising. This is a very good pitcher who goes deep in the games, but you know, the Dodgers are protective of him. He's a guy who had, uh, Tommy John in 2015 when he was a prospect so it's like you see it all across baseball that uh, if you look at so many different promising pitchers backgrounds they have a Tommy John in their past or it's coming up like Dustin May another exciting arm uh, his season now derailed and he's going to probably miss 12 14 16 months or so yeah I, I don't want to say it's totally the price that these guys are paying for emphasizing velocity over pitchability but I do think it's part of it yeah well, so the Phillies continue this Marlins series. They have Zach Eflin going in game two. And after that Marlins series comes three against the Red Sox. But this Miami team, it's been really pesky against the Phillies the last couple seasons. And they've, they've added some talent. I mean, Starling Marte is not playing in this series. He's out. He's on the shelf. Uh, but the pitchers that the Phillies are going to see in games two and three, Rodgers and Alcantara, they're really good arms. And I know that this is a Marlins team that a lot of people overlook, but when those two guys are on the mound, particularly Alcantara, who to me, when I look at him, I see a guy who's going to be in the majors for a dozen years and make 30 plus starts a bunch of times and pitch to like a three and a half ERA. I mean, those are two very challenging assignments for the Phils. Yeah. This, this lefty that's going to pitch Wednesday night, uh, Rogers is, is, I mean, he's been dazzling this year. Uh, he went in that draft where the Phillies took Adam Hazley, uh, who was back playing Clearwater, uh, getting back into shape. Uh, Sixto Sanchez hasn't picked up, you know, a ball in the major leagues. He's been at, at the at the minor league site building shoulder strength. Um, he's had He had conditioning issues in the uh, Philly system, and I think he still has them down there. So they're in no hurry. You know, I think they are. They want to get him on the mound, but they'd rather get him uh, in shape first. So they, they didn't activate him out of the gate. He's so – we haven't seen him yet. Obviously, a lot of local interest in him because uh, he and George Alfaro, Jorge Alfaro, is on the DL. Those are the two big guys in the JT Real Muto trade. And we didn't even talk about Real Muto. He's still out. Got soreness, you know, kind of a bone bruise at the base of his right hand, of his catching hand, you know, kind of where it sticks out of the mitt. So where the base sounds like where the base of the hand meets the wrist is swollen or sore or um he's got a contusion there so uh he had that blocking trying to block a pitch and the only way you get that better is by resting it so he's not on the il but we don't know if he's even going to play in this marlin series so was that a jose alvarado pitch that hurt real muto this most recent time do you remember that was that that game in st louis i think it was the david hale pitch in the dirt that um it, was Dale David on that walk-off loss, the wild pitch? Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to go back and look. But I'm just asking you because Jose Alvarado, I mean, it was even referenced by Ben Davis, the Phillies color analyst and, for, and former major league catcher uh, in the game Tuesday night. But when Andrew Knapp was trying to catch Jose Alvarado, 
Tuesday night. It's just like, it's impossible. You really have no idea where the ball's going. Uh, one of those Alvarado pitches is a pitch that did injure JT Real Muto early in spring training. Um, it's just, uh, you, you referenced it being an adventure. It really is. I mean, oh, he's gotten out a lot of these games unscathed, but it's like at any point in an outing can come 10 straight balls out of his left arm. Yeah, he's he's very unpredictable. If I was a manager, I, I you know, you love the stuff, but I mean, he would give me an ulcer, you know, because like you don't know if he's going to throw a strike, he's going to throw into the backstop, you know, if he's going to kill your catcher. I mean, I referenced that earlier a few minutes ago in that top of the eighth inning, he strikes out, he gets a third strike swinging on John Birdie, uh, and it's just off the plate, but it's got, you know, that. It's got that uh, sink to it at 100 miles an hour, and it goes right by Nap. And I'm like, well, was that catchable? Or was it 100 miles an hour moving like crazy? And maybe it is a wild pitch. I don't know. It's very tough. I know the official score ultimately thought it was 100 with crazy movement, and he scored it a wild pitch. Uh, but it didn't hit the dirt. It got you know by the catch. I don't know if it was catchable or not. Uh, ultimately... They came back, but that was a big play in the game. Yeah, he is an adventure. He's tough to catch. He is the guy, spun one in the dirt, and that broke JT's thumb. Um, man, these games pile up. I have to go back. JT got hurt in St. Louis on that walk-off wild pitch in the dirt, um, and I thought it was David Hale. Maybe we should take a timeout and check. Well, we just checked, and yes, it was David Hale. I still have some brain cells left. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, Jim, I feel the same way. These games really do blend in together. Once the season starts, I, I have trouble remembering what day it is, when I'm off, when I'm not, you know. So, um, OK, so our friends at points bet, I, I think this is kind of interesting. We're trying to look at different uh, different little uh, props that people can go with. And one of the things I noticed was the the first inning over under total runs scored for both teams. OK, so we're talking Zach Eflin against Trevor Rogers, two very good pitchers. The over-under for the first inning combined, 0 0.5 runs scored. It's an even bet, meaning $1 pays out $1. So the question is, do we think there's going to be a run scored in the first inning? You know, I'd say given the way that Zach Eflin is early and given the fact that this Rodgers has a 1.88 ERA, uh, this feels like it could be a pretty low-scoring game. Uh, I would I would agree with that. Um, I would agree with that. Though this kid, Jazz, Chisholm at the top of the Marlins lineup. He's exciting. Yeah. He maybe he um maybe he gets on and, and manufactures a little something and gets the Marlins one in the first inning. I, I I don't know, but I think you're probably on the money thinking it's going to be a low scoring game. You I know, mean, there's a chance it's always going to be low scoring with the Phillies. They can strike out 14 times and go 0 for 11 with runners in scoring position. 16 games this season with a dozen strikeouts, most in the National League. Um. So okay, you mentioned Jazz Chisholm there. I was looking back last night at the Marcelo Zuna trade when the Miami Marlins traded Ozuna uh, to the Cardinals. It was 2017, I believe, okay, or 2018. And in that trade, the Marlins got back Sandy Alcantara and Zach Gallen, who they then traded to the Diamondbacks to get Jazz Chisholm. I'm thinking, wow, that is a haul for Marcelo Zuna. Then I looked back and, like, at the time, people criticized the Marlins' return as too light. There are just so many examples, I feel like, over the years where – you look back at the initial responses to a big trade like that, and they don't match up to what the the, the response ends up being. Well, you know, it takes years sometimes to, to judge a trade, right? Uh, years. So uh, you're you're exactly right. Uh, I mean, those are some names in that deal. That's Zach Gallon, oh, man, and and this Chisholm kid. Um, it just tells you really the importance of pro scouting, and and, and I hate to see what's happening to that arm of the game a lot of teams have reduced their manpower and their workforce but you get a great pro scouting staff to dig into somebody's farm system i'm not talking about these kids who are you know not talking about scouting for the draft i'm talking about kids who were in pro ball for a year for two years for three years who are in somebody's system and you know you got a you got a hard working pro scout who's bearing down on them in a ball or on the backfields in spring training or the backfields in instructional league and and, um, you know, that that can really help a franchise when your GM calls you and say, I got something on the line with this team. Give me a diamond in the rough in that organization. Who, and then you, you nail it. Um, that's the importance of pro scouting. And that's why hopefully it never I know it's taken a hit, but 
I hope it comes back strong, and I hope the, the people that run this game realize how important it is. Jim, I got to know your thoughts on the big baseball controversy of the week, which is the White Sox and Twins, the 3-0 pitch that Yerman Mercedes hit a home run off of Williams Astadio, who's a position player. It was a 3-0 count. It was a 45-mile-per-hour pitch. The White Sox were up 12 runs in the ninth inning. Mercedes swung, hit one over the fence, became a bit of a controversy. I think what added to this controversy was that Tony La Russa, the White Sox manager, uh, really didn't back up his player. In fact, he said, like, you know, I understand why they threw at him in the next game and he can't do stuff like that. First off, the visual of uh, Astadio versus Mercedes, two, two heavyweights there. I mean, if you're an old school WWF fan, that's like watching Earthquake take on Typhoon. But uh, what well, did you think of... Uh, what did you think of the reaction to this? I mean, personally, I find myself veering more old school than like let the kids play. But in this case, I mean, really, what are you supposed to do? What is the difference between hitting a pitch on 3-1 versus hitting a pitch 3-0 there? Who are those two wrestlers you mentioned? Earthquake and Typhoon. Do they ring a bell for you? No, I'm more like a, a Mr. Fuji and Taro Tanaka. Mr. Fuji, I was going to say Yokozuna. Mr. Fuji was his manager, a legendary prankster, but we're getting off I topic. remember, I remember Mr. Fuji when he was actually a wrestler. He used to throw salt at the other guy's eyes. Yeah. Was that Taro Tanaka? There was, there was Taro Tanaka and Mr. Fuji, and one of them, I think it was Mr. Fuji, used to come out, and his signature move was to throw salt in the opponent's eyes. I, I got to question the sportsmanship of that. Well, yeah, and that sounds like Mr. Fuji because later in his career when he was a manager, he uh, cost Hulk Hogan the title by throwing fire into his eyes. Well, I, I, I love, when I was a kid, I loved pro wrestling. Uh, I, I used to go to it, uh, and uh, I, I, I loved uh, all those. Chief J. Strongbow was my guy. I loved Chief J. Strongbow and uh, Tony Gurria. And then um, I actually watched uh, the documentary on Roddy, Roddy, Rowdy Roddy Piper and – and the Macho Man, those were great documentaries on well, A&E. The Macho Man documentary has gotten a ton of criticism uh, from the wrestling community and from other people, too, that apparently it was, I haven't seen it yet, but apparently it was very unfair to his legacy. And it was only a lot of people said of that. Yeah, I, I just still found it interesting. I actually met him one night in uh, he was a former uh, catcher in the Cardinals and the Red System. And um, a few of us in spring training because he lived in the Clearwater area. And I know Bob Brookover was with us. I think Paul Hagen was with us. And we met him one night out to dinner. And we chatted with him a little bit because um, he had played for Lee Thomas when uh, Lee Thomas was the farm director with St. Louis Cardinals. He was in that system. So Lee was the Phillies GM in those days. And we were chatting about that. He was really nice. Uh, but I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, it seemed like they were a little hard on him. Uh, but he seemed like a pretty cool dude. And um we're off on one of our famous tangents, aren't we? But I love it because it results in you telling a story about meeting the Macho Man. But let's yeah, get I met the Macho. That. I was really because I loved the Macho Man. I was pretty, I was pretty pumped to meet meet him. Um, and uh, in the, it was, uh, I remember where I was. It was on, it was over in uh, like Indian Rocks, over near Clearwater, at an old Italian restaurant that was called Little Joe's. It's now something else, but still around there. But yeah, the Macho Man also. Um, met the Hulkster in uh, spring training a couple times because you'd see him around Clearwater and he came to the ballpark uh, a few years ago. Matter of fact, Matt Breen, who is a good friend of yours, has a picture of me and the Hulkster. Together. Really? I got to see that. At, at the ballpark in Clearwater, a uh, couple, couple of boys talking wrestling. Did Hulk take BP? No, no, he didn't. But he was a high school baseball player. Like He was a shortstop because he grew up in, in Tampa, I think. Uh, but, you know, Randy the Macho Man uh, was, was very – I mean, shit. He, uh, he, played pro, he played pro ball. He had to have been pretty good. All right, so let's get back to that White Sox twin situation. All right, here's my, here's my feeling. I love seeing the Tortuga pitching, man. That's his nickname. I love that nickname, the Tortuga. I mean, he was a Philly. He played in the Philly system. They used to – you know, he was – every year, he never would strike out. And I'm glad to see he's gotten – he had a pretty good run here in the major leagues. I skew old school pretty much on everything. I am all for emotion and, and, and say, I love a good celebration. Um, I love pumping up the dugout, but I don't like sticking the other guy's nose in. I think there's a fine line, right? And to me, that's a, you got a guy just trying to get through the game, throwing BP and you're swinging from the heels. That's a cheap home run. I'm going to skew old school on this and agree with Tony LaRusso, who I'm not even a big fan of. Um, uh, but but uh, I know there's other people who say, ah, you know, you're up there, let them swing away. Uh, I thought it crossed the lines 
just a little bit, but you know, I'm not going to put the guy in jail for 10 years either. And, you know, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it, but you know what, if they buzzed him, uh, you know, he deserved it. Sometimes the game has, has to police itself. And sometimes you have to skew towards sportsmanship. And sometimes you have to say to yourself, you know, do I really need to swing from, from the heels and hit this batting practice fastball out of the ballpark? Or can we just get this game over and go back to the hotel? Uh, so that's kind of where I am. Would it have been uh, rubbing the other team's nose in it if he singled up the middle as opposed to hitting a homer? I, the problem was with the swing, wasn't it? 3-0? 3-0 and a uh, – what was the score? Yeah, they were up 16-4 to four at the point. But, like, I guess my, my question is, like, all right, if, if it's the swing itself and he flies out or lines out, does anybody care? I mean, or do we only care because the ball went over the fence? Yeah, uh, probably it gets swept under the rug. Nobody notices, but lands over the wall. People notice it. So, um, like I said, I don't think it's a capital offense, but I thought it could have been avoided. And, and I, you know, I agree with I agree with a little bit with Tony Lewis here. So, well, it seems like there's about one of these a week now in baseball as the kind of the unwritten rules blend into the uh, new age of the game and. That's going to do it for this edition of the Phillies Talk Podcast. I'm Corey Seidman. He's Jim Salisbury. As the Phillies go on to try to win this series over the Miami Marlins. We'll catch you later in the week.